the General Overseas Service of All India Radio presents readings from an autobiography or the story of my experiments with truth. The reading from the autobiography is presented by Shri Gopala Krishna Gandhi, writer, teacher, and the youngest grandson of Kasturba Gandhi and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. The words of the Mahatma in the voice of his grandson. I had now to equip myself for the voyage. Some of the clothes I liked and some I did not like at all. The necktie which I delighted in wearing later I then abhorred. The short jacket I looked upon as immodest, but this dislike was nothing before the desire to go, to go to England, which was uppermost in my mind. I sailed at last from Bombay on the 4th of September. I had four notes of introduction to Dr. P. J. Mehta, to Srijut Dalpatram Shukla, to Prince Ranjit Singhji and to Dada Bhai Nauroji. Someone on board had advised us to put up at the Victoria Hotel in London and I accordingly went there. Dr. Mehta, to whom I had wired from Southampton, called at about eight o'clock the same evening. He gave me a hearty greeting. He smiled at being in white flannels. As we were talking, I casually picked up his top hat and trying to see how smooth his hat was, passed my hand over it the wrong way and disturbed the fur. Dr. Mehta looked somewhat angrily at what I was doing and stopped me, but the mischief had been done. The incident was a warning for the future. This was my first lesson in European etiquette into the details of which Dr. Mehta humorously initiated me. Do not touch other people's things, he said. Do not ask questions as we usually do in India on first acquaintance. Do not talk loudly. Never address people as sir while speaking to them as we do in India. I would continuously think of my home and country. My mother's love always haunted me. At night, the tears would stream down my cheeks and home memories of all sorts made sleep out of the question. It was impossible to share my misery with anyone. And even if I could have done so, where was the use? I knew of nothing that would soothe me. Everything was strange. The people, their ways and even their dwellings. I was a complete novice in the matter of English etiquette and continuously had to be on my guard. There was the additional inconvenience of the vegetarian vow. Even the dishes that I could eat were tasteless and insipid. England I could not bear, but to return to India was not to be thought of. Now that I had come, I must finish the three years, said the inner voice. I undertook the all too impossible task of becoming an English gentleman. The clothes after the Bombay cut that I was wearing were, I thought, unsuitable for English society and I got new ones at the army and navy stores. I also went in for a chimney pot hat costing 19 shillings, an excessive price in those days. And not content with this, I wasted 10 pounds on an evening suit made in Bond Street, the centre of fashionable life in London, and got my good and noble-hearted brother to send me a double watch chain of gold. It was not correct to wear a ready-made tie and I learned the art of tying one for myself. While in India, the mirror had been a luxury permitted on the days when the family barber gave me a share. Here, I wasted ten minutes every day before a huge mirror, watching myself arranging my tie and parting my hair in the correct fashion. My hair was by no means soft and every day it meant a regular struggle with the brush to keep it in position. And as if all this were not enough to make me look the thing, I directed my attention to other details that were supposed to go towards the making of an English gentleman. I was told it was necessary for me to take lessons in dancing. So I decided to take dancing lessons at a class and paid down three pounds as fees for a term. 
I must have taken about six lessons in three weeks, but it was beyond me to achieve anything like rhythmic motion. I could not follow the piano and hence found it impossible to keep time. Let no one imagine that my experiments in dancing and the like marked a stage of indulgence in my life. I had my wits about me. I kept account of every farthing I spent and my expenses were calculated carefully. Every little item, such as omnibus fares or postage or a couple of coppers spent on newspapers would be entered and the balance struck every evening before going to bed. That habit has stayed with me ever since. And I know that as a result, though I have had to handle public funds amounting to lakhs, I have succeeded in exercising strict economy in their disbursement and instead of outstanding debts have had invariably a surplus balance in respect of all the movements I have led. Let every youth take a leaf out of my book and make it a point to account for everything that comes into and goes out of his pocket and like me he is sure to be a gainer in the end. I made an effort to simplify my life. I felt I could surely have one room instead of two and cook some of my meals at home. That would be a saving of four to five pounds each month. I came across books on simple living. I gave up the suite of rooms and rented one instead, invested in a stove and began cooking my breakfast at home. The process scarcely took me more than 20 minutes for there was only oatmeal porridge to cook and water to boil for cocoa. I had lunch out and for dinner bread and cocoa at home. Thus I managed to live on a shilling and three pence a day. This was also a period of intensive study. Plain living saved me plenty of time and I passed my examination. Let not the reader think that this living made my life by any means a dreary affair. On the contrary, the change harmonized my inward and outward life. It was also more in keeping with the means of my family. My life was certainly more truthful and my soul knew no bounds of joy. Towards the end of my second year in England, I came across two theosophists. They talked to me about the Gita. They were reading Sir Edwin Arnold's translation, the song Celestial, and they invited me to read the original with them. I felt ashamed as I had read the divine poem neither in Sanskrit nor in Gujarati. I was constrained to tell them that I had not read the Gita but that I would gladly read it with them. I began reading the Gita with them. The book struck me as one of priceless worth. The impression has ever since been growing on me with the result that I regard it today as the book par excellence for the knowledge of truth. It has afforded me invaluable help in my moments of gloom. About the same time, I met a good Christian from Manchester in a vegetarian boarding house. He said, do please read the Bible. I accepted his advice and he got me a copy. The Sermon on the Mount went straight to my heart. My young mind tried to unify the teaching of the Gita, the Light of Asia and the Sermon on the Mount that renunciation was the highest form of religion appealed to me. There was a great exhibition at Paris in 1890. I had read about its elaborate preparations and I also had a keen desire to see Paris. So I thought I had better combine two things in one and go there at this juncture. You just heard the reading from the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi, presented by Sri Gopala Krishna Gandhi, the youngest grandson of Kasturba Gandhi and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi.